welcome everyone to the first edition of 2021 uh, of the Space Meetup Community of Interest uh, in Wellington, although I see we've got quite a national presence uh, go at, that started in 2020. Just a reminder, this is a this is for anyone interested in creating a space ecosystem, industry, and or community within New Zealand in light of a new resurgence of interest in space technologies, capabilities, and exploration. Uh, a shout out to Space Base. Thank you, Emmeline and Eric Dahlstrom, uh, who continue to allow who continue to just uh, not only support us, but allow us to uh, big borrow and steal resources from them. We are forever grateful. And uh, in addition, tonight, Emmeline has found us a fantastic speaker. Uh, we just got a quick preview of that. I'm going to introduce uh, Douglas Messier. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Excellent. Uh, is the managing editor of ParaboliCArc.com, a daily blog that covers commercial space and much more a skilled writer and analyst with more than two decades of experience in covering space exploration and conveying complex scientific and policy issues to the public. Doug has had a varied career amongst some of the more interesting uh, and pertinent ones for this evening. SEO analyst at Yahoo, software tester for, within a startup company, manager of distance education, at a university, science editor and curriculum developer, script writer who pitched stories to Star Trek, easily my favorite one so far, and <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, and uh, current, Doug currently resides in Mojave, California, in order to be where the action is for the suborbital and new space industry. He serves as director of testing, communications, and social outreach for an entrepreneurial software company. A graduate. Oh, I'm sorry? That was, a, that was a past job. Ah, I stand corrected. Thank you. Uh, graduate of the International Space University Summer Session Program, which I would speculate where he met Emmeline. And in addition, the George Washington University, where Doug studied at the Space Policy Institute having an undergraduate degree in journalism. Sounds like it's gonna be a fantastic discussion. Doug, before I hand it over to you, just a quick reminder for those of you who are new, uh, feel free to type uh, your questions into the chat function or just ask them at the end. We will have a Q and A session at the end of the uh, talk. Thanks very much, Doug, over to you. Well, thanks for having me here. And uh, we're going to give a, a very kind of overview of, of what Mojave is, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of it, uh, answer those questions, uh, give a brief history of the uh, spaceport, um, and discuss um, a lot of the lessons that uh, you can learn uh, from this facility. It's a unique facility. And uh, why don't we just uh, get right into it? So. The uh, motto is that the imagination flies here. Um, and the, the cynical view is that imagination flies, but not much else. So um, not everybody's a big fan, but we'll get into that. So where is Mojave? It's about uh, 100. You can see it up in the uh, top there. It's um, about 160 kilometers from downtown Los Angeles down here. And you see this uh, brown area, that's Edwards Air Force Base, which is a major test center. So uh, we're at uh, 2762 feet, which is 842 meters above sea level. Uh, there's a small town of about 4,200 people. Uh, we have two seasons, hot and windy, cold and windy. Um, can get uh, to about 110 Fahrenheit and it can get down into the teens um, well below uh, zero Celsius uh, in the winter. Sometimes we get snow down in the valley. 
I'd like to say we have no weather, just temperatures and wind speeds. And that makes for good flying when the wind is not excessive. Uh, speaking of Star Trek, um, it's the future home of Captain Christopher Pike. And in his day, in somewhere in the future, there's a thriving metropolis with uh, 80 kilometers of, of um, parkland around it. And that sounds like a really great environment to be in. And I'm, I'm not going to live to see it. And it's very different from what we have here. It's very brown and a lot of sagebrush. And there's mountains to the west and maybe, I don't know, 7,000 uh, wind turbines out there. It's very windy here. So the Mojave Airport was established 1935 with two dirt runways and it serviced the, the gold and silver mines up here. Uh, became a Marine Corps training base in 1941 after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, they did training for um, Marine Corps aces, uh, a number of the aces in the Pacific War trained here, including uh, Pappy Boyington and a, a few others, a number of others. He used to have a swimming pool, which I, I wish they still had. That was large. They did a water egress. Uh, so the Marine Corps uh, kind of, the Navy took it over for a year and then the Marine Corps reactivated it in 1951 for the Korean War. Uh, Kern County got control of it again in uh, the early 60s. And in 1972, there was this rancher named Dan Savovich, a rancher and a pilot who, who thought that the, this would make a good civilian test center, that they could really do something with this. So they, they formed the East Kern Airport District. This is a state chartered district and the airport's run by an elected board that's elected by the citizens of the, the nearby communities. That's a five member board. They serve for several years. Um, um, so that's how it kind of runs. And so um, Savage was on to something. He had Edwards Air Force Base, uh, which is nearby. And that's that's where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. It's where they tested the X-15 and they still test today. Uh, the NASA Armstrong Flight Research Center um, is located at that base. Uh, what they have here is a super overland supersonic corridor, and you hear that pretty regularly here, not every day, but um, there's usually jets coming um, in and out of uh, Edwards that break the sound barrier, and you suddenly hear this giant <laughs> and the, the walls and the windows kind of shake and the doors shake. And um, it's known as the Aerospace Valley. Um, it also had Lockheed Martin Skunk Works is still located down in Palmdale. The space shuttles were built there. And uh, China Lake, um, which I think is connected to the Top Gun movies, uh, is up in Ridgecrest about an hour north of here. So there's, there's a lot of talent and that, that helps a lot uh, when you're building up, up something because uh, when I, when I first moved here, we had a, a neighbor, I had a neighbor who, who made parts in a, a workshop. He made parts for the companies that um, you know, function here at the airport. He also manufactures down in LA. Um, and x got a bunch of money and they, they were making a move to Midland, Texas, which is an oil rich area. Uh, Permian Basin, and they thought it'd be easy to just find workers, oil workers that you know would be available and be able to be trained to make aerospace parts. And, and um, that didn't work out very well. The, the move didn't work out very well, and Xcor is now kind of bankrupt. It went bankrupt a few years ago and is no longer functioning. Um, Mojave's got uh, some real advantages and and some real drawbacks. Uh, it's a remote location, lightly populated. There's not a lot of people over uh, complain about what's going on, about the noise. Um, overland supersonic corridor that helps for testing. You can do flight tests over remote mountains and areas that are north of here. Uh, drawbacks, uh, hot summer, cold winters. Um, companies here have difficulty holding on to employees because there's, there's better places to live. Um, Mojave is very small, very limited housing. So most people live down uh, south of here and uh, the cities of Lancaster and Palmdale. Um, they're kind of a sprawling suburban area on the northern end of Los Angeles County. 
but they're in the same desert as as Mojave. So you have that same, uh, you know, uh, extremes and temperatures, and you're you're not in the center of things. And you have a lot of startups. You have uh, startups like um, not startups anymore, but you, you have companies like SpaceX that are are much sexier and more exciting to work for. You get Blue Origin. There's there's a whole um, aerospace is really booming. So there's a lot of competition and, and some of the, the startups around here can't really offer a lot in terms of uh, salary and benefits and so on. So it's not the best location to work. Um, so location, location, location is really important, but you really need to attract talent. And uh, Mojave was very lucky to have Bert Rutan um, he formed a Rutan aircraft factory in 1974, and he made long easies and other planes that, that, you know, they kind of came in kits and you would build them. He established uh, scale composites in 1982, and he, he came up with a lot of innovative designs for airplanes, and he's got five airplanes and one spacecraft that have been donated to the, Smith, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. So that, that's a very talented guy, and he'll come up in our story a little later. Um, what he really put Mojave on the map was this nonstop around the world flight that um, they did in December of uh, 1986. You can see uh, that's the Voyager airplane, and um, his brother uh, Dick Rutan and uh, Gina Yeager flew that around the world for nine days and stop, no refueling. It was built in Mojave, flight was uh, in and out of Edwards, but the, the control center was here. They ran it from here. Um, and it was a, composite, a carbon composite construction, which at the time wasn't used much in, I don't think was used much in aviation. Um, so by 2021, um, we had a lot of companies come in, some, some succeeded, some failed, some went out of business. Uh, so in 2021, we had major tenants uh, include Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit, Scale Composites, Strata Launch, um, and you can see the list there. And Virgin Galactic, obvious space tourism, Virgin Orbit just had a successful um, air launch. Scale is the company that built Spaceship One and Spaceship Two. Uh, Stratolaunch is doing air launch of, of hypersonic missiles, and uh, Mastin has a contract to uh, land uh, um, payloads on the moon. And um, so uh, Mojave is the world headquarters for air launch. So the, the first one was this one on the left, the Stargazer, that's an L-1011. I think it's the only L-1011 that still exists. And um, there's a solid fuel rocket, the Pegasus XL, that goes underneath the wing, or not the wing, but the body itself. And then on the right, you have um, Cosmic Girl, uh, the Virgin Orbit uh, system that uh, just launched Launcher 1 uh, recently. Um, of course, you've got White Knight 2, Spaceship 2, the Virgin Galactic. They do their manufacturing and their test here and uh, their operating base is out in New Mexico in, uh, at Spaceport America. And then you've got uh, the Rock, uh, which is Stratolaunch. It's also known as Stratogoose, Carbon Goose, and Birdzilla, uh, just because of its size. And also it's, um, it's kind of comparison to the Spruce Goose that, that um, Howard Hughes uh, built um, in the 1940s. Uh, it's got a wingspan of 117.3 meters, which is 385 feet. Um, that's the white, biggest wingspan in the world of any aircraft. Um, and it, it is, um, it's jaw dropping to see in, in, in person. The first time I saw it in person, um, I, went, uh, I went with a neighbor and we went to a bar um, located, a uh, bar restaurant located outside the gate. And we drove through the airport and we looked down and we saw something, we weren't sure what it was. 
So we went out and had a beer, had dinner, and then drove back. And we drove down the road to see what was there. And it was just sitting outside, sitting outside the hangar. And and we just sat there in the car, car with the jaw dropping going, ah, uh, you know, it's just the, the scale of that thing is, is amazing. And uh, we also were there for the um, first test, first and only test flight so far of this thing. Um, yeah, it was just amazing to see. And the thing is so big that when you see it flying, it doesn't look like it's, it looks like it's barely moving because of the, the optics of it, you know, be flying through there. And it, it's so big that it doesn't look like it's moving very quickly. And, uh, but it was, it was great to see um, actually fly. And it was supposed to launch satellites and then Paul Allen died and his sister wasn't really interested. And they sold it to another company that is doing, um, they're developing hypersonic vehicles to test hypersonic uh, technologies. So we're hoping to see that thing fly again. Uh, I think it's been about two years since it flew. So, um, so Mojave Air Spaceport, it has a lot of different income streams. It's a general aviation airport. Um, so people have hangars here and planes, they fly out of here. It's the first licensed inland spaceport in 2004. Uh, there's a rocket engine test area, um, an industrial park. Uh, there's a, a civilian uh, national test pilot school and aircraft maintenance and an aircraft uh, boneyard and storage. So. But none of that really keeps the airport in business. What keeps the airport in business is this. Um, there are thousands of wind turbines out to the, the west of us in the mountains and in the plains. And uh, Mojave um, struck a deal uh, some years ago to be a staging ground for the parts. So they come in on a flat uh, rail cars, they're unloaded and they're put on really long trucks and trucked up to the uh, actual construction sites. So um, it's good to, if you're doing something like this, is to think about every kind of major or minor income stream you can get. And that's been particularly profitable for Mojave and it's allowed them to do a lot of this testing that, you know, uh, host a lot of other stuff. And it's put them in a, a very good financial position. It's been very profitable. Um, now, the airport uh, management has, has practiced a fairly hands-off approach to, to regulation. And um, the tenants have had a lot of leeway in how they do their operations. Um, there's a very conservative kind of libertarian view out here of, of government uh, and, and regs and the FAA. Um, the drawback to that is that, um, you know, a hands-off approach doesn't always allow for uh, proper safety and it can lead to accidents and it has, and we'll talk about that in a, in a few moments. Um, one thing the airport has done very well um, is to forge very good links with the uh, members of Congress and uh, good links with the FAA and uh, that allows them to get legislation that they want that, that helps the, uh, the spaceport and the airport. And it's allowed them to tap into millions of dollars in, in funding to upgrade the, the runways and other facilities out here. So um, good political support is very important if you're running anything like this. Um, so this is, um, this is sitting in a small park at the airport. It's, it's called the Rotary Rocket Roton, and it was the first rocket slash helicopter. Now this thing had rocket engines in its, um, at the bottom, and it was supposed to fly to space, and then it was going to deploy the payload and then come down, and at some point um, they've got um, helicopter blades. Uh, that would deploy and it, it would fly back down and it would be fully reusable. And that kind of window that you see in the middle, that's the cockpit. And Brian Binney is, is one of the test pilots who would later fly Spaceship One. That was the scariest thing ever flew. 
and they did take off and fly down the uh, kind of the the, the ramp down the, the taxiway uh, here once. Uh, but you know, it, it's it's not the best thing for figuring out how high you are, or you know, in terms of vision. So he was, I think, he was pretty happy to get off that project, and um, that project ended in 1999, I believe. And they managed to, um, I think, they got this thing out of a junkyard and put it back in Mojave, and it, it sits there now. And there's two ways of looking at that. Well, it's, you know, a big waste of money and it didn't work and it was stupid, but um, the way Stu Witt, who used to run, who used to be administrator of the airport CEO, um, says, you know, it spawned off three different companies. So people took that experience and, and you know, formed other companies. And one of them was x which was building a, a small uh, space plane, um, which, as I mentioned, didn't, uh, didn't succeed either, but uh, so you saw that as a as a, a sign of what Mojave was about and taking risks and um, letting people you know experiment with things and you often learn a lot from failures. So it's it's an interest it's an interesting philosophy and it, it kind of summed up how how Stu sees things. Um, so we get to. Um, really put uh, Mojave on the map in terms of space uh, was this $10 million Ansari X Prize that was announced in uh, 1996. The first privately built crewed uh, vehicle to get to space twice in two weeks. Um, the boundary was set at 100 kilometers or 60 miles. So Bert Rutan scaled um, uh, his scale composites uh, teamed up with uh, Microsoft Paul, Microsoft's Paul Allen, who provided about $28 million to, to build a uh, Spaceship One. And it was carried aloft underneath uh, this uh, uh, airplane called White Knight. So they had an end of 20, 2004 deadline for this thing. And you may recognize some people here. Uh, anyone? Emily? Yeah, no? that's, that's, the, that's my back. <laughs> yeah, you may recognize the backs of some people's heads here. Um, the short one is Emmeline. Uh, to the left is Eric. And that's me with the camera um, filming. And kind of in the middle, a little bit hard to see, kind of down the, the taxiway is, is uh, White Knight and uh, Spaceship One. So, um, that was taken, uh, that was done June 21st of 2004. And um, yeah, it was a fun trip. And the guy that took the picture is uh, another ISU alumnus uh, from 91, my year, uh, John Chriswick, who um, made it big in software and now has a ticket on Virgin Galactic if they ever fly customers. Um, so, um, Interesting story. And there is um, Mike Melville on top of Spaceship One. I think that was after that flight. And somebody in the crowd had given him a sign that says Spaceship One, Government Zero. So that was kind of the attitude of this thing. It was a big uh, event. Uh, thousands of people were there and people really saw it as the beginning of a new era of you know, commercial space flight. And um, NASA was grounded at the time after the spaceship or the space shuttle Columbia accident. So this was, you know, this is a big deal for, for what became known as new space or what was called new space at the time. So um, months after that, they had two suborbital flights in the end of September and early October. Uh, they're both successful, so they claim the $10 million prize. Alan split that $5 million with, um, he did five and five uh, million uh, with, this, with the scaled crew. Uh, he licensed the technology to Richard Branson. And between the uh, prize, the licensing agreement, and donating the, the ship to the Smithsonian, uh, he actually made a profit on his $28 million investment. 
um, probably not a big profit and for, for a billionaire, not a huge, you know, probably pocket change by comparison, but um, it, it proved that you could make money off this thing. Um, so Branson came in, he was um, very enthusiastic. He said, well, well Spaceship Two uh, will be flying people as early as 2007. Uh, the initial investment was supposed to be 108 million. They were supposed to build uh, two mothership, uh, White Knight Two motherships, and I think five uh, Spaceship Twos. Um, things didn't go well. Uh, we'll talk about why. Commercial service is, is now maybe this year, hopefully mid-year. And the investment is probably well north of a billion, maybe closer to two billion when you get all the way down to it, which is uh, an absurd, it's almost an absurd amount for what you're trying to do. And it's not clear whether they're ever gonna make a profit if you, they may make annual profits, but they may not be able to you know, make back the initial investment uh, in the end. And if you want to think about an aviation analogy, I would say probably the Concorde, where the Concorde uh, came in. It had um, the, it, it blew past all of the, um, the financial estimates that they they estimated it would cost. It was supposed to have over 100 uh, were supposed to be built, and in the end, they built 20, and only 12 ever went into service. So. Uh, it's an example of a, a optimistic uh, technology project that, uh, although it made annual profits, it, it probably didn't make back its investment. Um, so uh, don't get cocky, kid, which is what um, Han Solo said to uh, Luke after he blasted a imperial ship out of the out of space. Um, so Rutan calls NASA naysay, bureaucratic to make rules. Um, he said after winning the prize that NASA was shaking in their boots at what he had done. And a, a real disdain for NASA. Um, and that, that uh, permeated Mojave. And I, I saw a lot of it at XCOR. I see it at other, at other companies where they, they had a real disdain for NASA, a real disdain for how NASA had lost two crews in, in space and another on the ground. Um, there's a feeling um, on the safety side that the uh, space agency didn't have much to teach them. Um, the truth is that Spaceship One was a very fragile vehicle, it's experimental. Uh, the pilot, Pete Siebold, um, was supposed to be on the first Ansari X Prize flight in September 2004. He backed out because he didn't feel like the, the ship was well understood and needed more testing. And he, he'd also had a recent health scare. Um, so there were serious issues during the actual flights themselves. So it looked to outsiders that this was a really good technology to, to base a commercial a ship on. But in reality, and then particularly in retrospect, it, it wasn't necessarily um, that way. And it, I think the, the Spaceship 2 program has suffered from that. So you have limits on prize, the limits of prizes. Prizes can do a lot of things. They can move technology forward, but they're not a substitute for a, a real technological roadmap. And what you had was pretty risky and proven technology. Uh, there, was, there was not a lot of experience with hybrids. What they were using was a, a rubber core that burned and nitrous oxide to burn it. Um, they only had six powered flights. They had 17 flights overall, including a couple of captive carries. So six powered flights, three to space, uh, some of them with major issues. Um, on one flight, um, it rolled 29 times. Uh, and another powered flight, it skidded off the runway. Uh, there were issues. So one of the problems is that um, the way this, uh, the prize was funded, it was the way the program was funded, it was to win a prize by a certain date with a certain requirement. So you're building to the prize and not necessarily long-term. And the other problem is that well, Rutan wanted to continue flying Spaceship One for a period. And they would fly their friends, they would fly people and advertise space tourism. And 
um, Paul Allen was scared to death. He had, he had seen the test flight programs. He had seen the, uh, you know, the, the near misses and the, the close calls. And um, he was a software guy. So you write a piece of software, you press a button, it crashes, you go debug it, then you try it again. Um, Spaceship One involved lives, involved um, people uh, could die from it. So he said, no, I'm not gonna continue funding flights or we're gonna end it right after the prize. And he also had a financial incentive uh, because he, he had a tax write-off for donating the ship to the Smithsonian. So that helped him make some money um, off of the deal. And um, I think he was probably right. And I think if they continued flying that thing, they probably would have, they might well have killed somebody. And they might have, have had this thing all over the desert and there would be nothing to donate to the Smithsonian. So, um, but you never know, you can't run history backwards. So we'll, we'll never know what might have happened. Um, and there's limits to screw it, let's do it, which is Richard Branson's favorite phrase. Uh, Virgin Group had no experience with um, this kind of stuff. It's, it's very much a first generation suborbital tourism vehicle. It's, it's not a seventh generation Boeing jet like the 747 or the 777. Or, um, it, he really came in at the end of the Spaceship uh, Two program or the Spaceship One program and he, he wasn't with it throughout and didn't really understand the complexities of it. Um, and Virgin uh, Galactic was primarily a marketing sales group during its early years. It didn't have a lot of expertise. So it seemed like a dream partnership in the sense that um, Scale would do the technical side and Branson was great at marketing and promotion and, and figure out what the customers wanted. Um, but they had very different philosophies on publicity, on testing. Um, Scale would never announce a test ahead of time. Um, we mostly knew when they were going to fly by watching the NOTAMs, the notice to airmen that were posted by the FAA. They, they have to be posted 24 hours in advance. And if we saw a particular NOTAMs, we'd know and be able to go out there and, and film and, and photograph things. Um, Branson wants to publicize everything. Um, he made a um, virgin had absurd timelines. Every time you turn around every few months, Branson would be predicting that they'd be flying in 18 months, 16 months, 12 months, eight months. And the dates would come, the dates would go, and then he'd make other predictions. And finally, they, people got sick of it and they told him to not make predictions anymore. Um, so it became kind of a running joke with the press corps and uh, they also made absurd promises on safety. Um, they were promising that this, the, the, this ship could be potentially, they, they qualified it, a thousand times safer than anything that had ever flown in space before. And there's absolutely no way to know that until you've flown, you know, a thousand times or, you know, or whatever number. To, to match what other space flights have occurred. You don't know that until you test it and you fly it, you see how robust it is and you see if you can fly it a hundred times or 50 times or 25 times without you know, crashing and, and killing somebody. Um, so they made, you know, it was just marketing out the wazoo and they were trying to sell tickets. So by 2014, they had sold 700 tickets and there's some people that were part of the Founders Club where they, they paid the full $200,000. Um, some people um, that I know paid, you know, 10 or, you know, paid half or maybe 10% of it. They put, put down money to, for reservations and then the rest would be owed when they, they finally got around to flying. Um, so Spaceship Two, what were the problems with Spaceship Two? Um, I think Scale was both overconfident and underexperienced. Um, scaling up the technology um, was not easy. 
I think I mentioned the um, the oscillations caused by the, the larger kind of uh, rubber core that they were burning. That was one issue. And they didn't really understand the dangers of nitrous oxide, which was um, uh, very dangerous. And the feather system, which, which reconfigures the ship in a sort of a shuttlecock uh, to, to lighten the reentry into the atmosphere, um, was it was pretty innovative but not tested very much and the fundamental problem they had was that they designed the ship for six passengers and two pilots and the size of it without figuring out the engine and they assumed that the engine could be easily scaled up and they screwed that up and that caused a, that a, you know it caused years of delays and it's the same mistake that um, Scale Composites made the Stratolaunch uh, airplane, and it was the same mistake there. Stratolaunch went through, um, first they were going to do Dynetics, was going to build a rocket for some reason. And then the story is that um, Paul Allen met Elon Musk somewhere, and Elon said, hey, I can build your rocket. So they went with Elon and SpaceX, and they were going to build an air-launched version, that, a, a scale-down version of the Falcon 9 that would be roughly the Falcon 5, you know, maybe five engines. And then a year went by and nothing got done. And then they went to, um, they went to uh, Orbital Sciences uh, Corporation. Um, and um, a friend of ours was, was in, Jim Bryce was running that team. So that went for like a year and then they decided, well, uh, the economics don't work. And then they went to everybody who had a, a rocket or an engine or a plan for a rocket or an engine. They talked to Mastin, they talked to everybody kind of trying to figure this out. And they finally went with this company called Firefly and that would be a liquid rocket they were going to launch. And then the um, the Falcon 9 blew up on, well, well, they blew up on the pad. I don't know if you remember when the Falcon 9, they were feeling it for pre-flight test and it, it just exploded. And Paul Allen said, no, nah, we're, we're not going to launch a, a liquid rocket on this thing. It could blow up the, you know, it could, blast this giant airplane out of the sky. So they ended up going with uh, with Pegasus. And that was the, the Pegasus XL is already launched by the, the Northrop Grumman L-1011 that's right down the flight line from where Stratolaunch is. So it, it was just uh, kind of crazy stuff. And so they, they made the same mistake twice and, and it became a real problem. But uh, the real issue was, um, yeah, I kind of got sidetracked there, but the, the dangers of nitrous oxide and really not understanding that. And that was the result. Uh, now what they were doing, this is the test stand at Mojave and it um, and a, a real tragedy. Now what happened is they were doing a cold flow test of nitrous oxide. They were flowing it through a new valve they were testing. There was no fuel, but, and they thought nitrous oxide was safe. So there were 11 people near the test stand, near the tank, uh, when it suddenly exploded like seconds into the test. So three people were killed, three others hospitalized, and the explosion, explosions in the industry are part of the course that happen, but you, you don't usually lose people on them. And there was a lack of understanding so these are the three guys that died in July of, 2000, of 2007, uh, three engineers at Scale Composites. And that's a plaque on a, on a, mall, on a wall in the, um, in the Legacy Park, which is, is uh, inside the airport. Um, so do you think they would have learned their lesson about nitrous oxide, where to store it, how to handle it safely. Uh, they didn't. Um, this is a fire on June 6, 2014. I took uh, two pictures of this and then ran from my car and drove off the airport. Now, what happened here is they were stealing pallets of rocket fuel 
next to a stationary tank of nitrous oxide and they also had a, a trailer of nitrous oxide, um, like an 18 wheel type thing. And so the fire erupted on the pallets and this is like 10 feet away. Scale composite and one of their employees ran out and told the firefighters to hose down the tanks because if they, the tanks got too hot, they just explode. So uh, Virgin Galactic would later claim the pallets of fuel had only been there a day. They were going to be stored. They're going to be taken to dump. I don't know why they were dumping that stuff at dump. You want rocket fuel there necessarily. Uh, I had two sources that told me that these things had been there for, for months. Uh, been stored next to the nitrous tank. And I, I think it was an example of lack of safety at the spaceport. Um, it's good to give um, companies a lot of wide latitude, but um, you can't always assume they know what the hell they're doing. So I, that was one of the, the biggest criticisms I had of, of um, the way the spaceport under operate and under Stu Witt. He would he would give them a wide latitude and then he would deal with the, the fallout later. But if the fallout and the fallout can be um, you know can cost human lives. And if those tanks had exploded, it would have been it, they were sitting right kind of in the middle of the industrial area, the industrial park, and there was an explosion of nitrous oxide in I think 2002 in the Netherlands, and this guy had, um, I guess, been uh, putting it into a, he'd been transferring it from a, a stationary tanks to his tanker truck. And he left the area and the thing overheated and it, it blew up and part of the tank ended up 400 meters away. So if this had gone off and it had been a big explosion, it could have taken out a lot of a lot of things. It probably would have killed the firefighters. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, the 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 uh, region's only um, emergency helicopter, the air rescue, was was uh, parked on the the on the ramp not too far away. On the other side of this hangar where this stuff was was a hazardous waste. County hazardous waste facility um, could have gone, uh, could have done real damage. Um, so I think that one lesson um, you guys have to learn if you're going to set up anything like that is, is safety. And it's good to give people leeway, but um, you don't want uh, terrible things like that happening at your facilities. And you need to appoint somebody with authority to you know, step in and say, you know, we're not going to have this or you can't do that. Um, so uh, Spaceship Two powered flight one occurred on April 29th, uh, 2013. Uh, this came after several years of um, glide flights and captive carry flights. Um, what happened afterwards was pretty funny. Well, there's Branson and uh, Rattan. They're all excited and surrounded. Branson would come out for big flights, like uh, the first one and, and um, first powered flight and other things. And um, so that day, Branson declared success. He announced an immediate price increase from 200,000 to 250,000. And that was actually pretty smart. It sounded kind of ridiculous since they never flew anyone and they're, they're years behind schedule. But the idea was to get anybody who'd been on the fence wondering if this thing was real to sign up before the, the price increase went. And then people who you know were new to this thing, ah, I, I, I should I should sign up now. So he, he talks about flying on Christmas Day dressed as Santa Claus out of um, Spaceport America, um, which was kind of absurd in itself because if you, if you understood how much effort went into planning and executing a flight like this, um, it, it's a lot to ask of both your own staff and, and the Spaceport staff to do. And, and frankly, I wouldn't have gone 
Yeah, that's the last thing I want to do is go out to New Mexico in December. Probably pretty cold and miserable, or maybe rainy, and and watch this guy float around, you know. And and if I don't go there and I don't get an invite, my relation with VG wasn't great at the time. Um, the, the, the last thing I want to do is be watching him on NBC. They had a deal with NBC to broadcast it on, on Christmas Day. You know, that's the last thing anybody wants to do. Anyway, that, that was the crazy part of it. But the crazy part of it was there's, there's no effing way he could do that by Christmas 2013 unless he was on Santa's sled because there wasn't enough time and and the, the spaceship didn't have enough power to do it. And there wasn't enough time to do proper flight testing between the end of April and December. And, and they were having real problems with the engine. So the first three powered flights were in uh, April and September, I think of 2013 and then January, 2014. Uh, they were limited to 20 second burns because of the oscillations and the vibration problems. They tried to keep that quiet. Um, engineers had a breakthrough at the end of 2013, which required modifications to the ship, and they did some uh, they did some glide flights to test those. And then a, a flight with a 38 second burn was set for oh, all days Halloween 2014. That's a Friday as well. It was not a good time to test. So this was the result. Um, I was out about 20 miles or so north. It's about 30 kilometers north of Mojave um, with uh, my friend Ken Brown, who's a great photographer, and, and a, a guy, Tom Mummy, who was, just happened to be in town and came out to see this thing. Um, and all the photos that you saw that day were from those guys. Now, this is a photo that was released nine months later um, that shows the breakup of the ship um, by a, a special camera. Those were not released at the time, but uh, everything you saw uh, that day were from, from Tom and, and uh, Ken. And um, after that, we ended up, um, I'll show you that, get ahead of myself. Uh, so what happened is that the, the ship, um, Chase Your Two Feather kind of re- um, orients the tail um, kind of into a, a shuttlecock when they're re-entering re the atmosphere. So, and, and the co-pilot was supposed to release, uh, unlock the feather device uh, when they hit Mach 1.4. Now, if that didn't unlock, they would have to dump the nitrous oxide and hightail it back to Mojave because um, if it didn't unlock, then they couldn't re-enter without the feather properly. So Mike Ellsbury got ahead of himself, um, unlocked it going transonic. There was absolutely nothing to prevent him from doing that. And the aerodynamic forces were so strong that it ended up um, deploying the feather with the, the rocket burning. So Ellsbury died in the backup. Uh, Pete Siebel was able to uh, parachute to safety um, he had uh, arm was broken in four places and he had um, composite material in his eye and some other injuries, but he was he recovered and returned to flight status. So this is what I'm talking about. This was taken from a tail boom camera and you can see the ship beginning to break up. You can see um, down here that the, the engine is lighting and they're going they're going upstairs, they're going to space or not to space, but they're going to higher altitude and the ship is reconfiguring and there's a whole series of shots that ended up in the NTSB report um, showing the ship uh, gradually kind of coming apart and this is kind of the early part and they showed um, pieces of the thing kind of um, peeling off and Seabold who was in command had no idea that Ellsbury had um, unlocked it early so he, he was completely surprised. He ended up uh, losing consciousness. His, his mask um, had been broken. So he, he fell and he's falling at a very high altitude. So it's very cold. And then he, he kind of came through, I guess, long enough to um, 
he separated himself from his seat and then he apparently lost consciousness again and then was jolted awake uh, when the parachute deployed automatically at 14,000 feet. So he was, he was very lucky to survive. Um, Alice Berry um, died in the breakup and he part of the, um, part of the cockpit um, crashed onto Kentill Road. Um, and I'll show you what that looked like. We, we came upon this scene. So um, this is what the part of the cockpit came down and, and narrowly missed a couple of truck drivers who were just passing that very scene. Um, so that's where Alsbury and part of the cockpit came down and they were, uh, it's a very disturbing scene. And uh, this happened about, 10, I think it broke up at about 10, 20 in the morning. I'd been up for about four hours and I was so rattled that I think I, I got to bed at about 10 o'clock um, Saturday night. This was a Friday morning it happened. So I was up for about 40 hours and um, yeah, it was, it's pretty awful. So the popular shorthand is that this was pilot error. What the NTSB said is that the failure of scale to um, imagine that this happened, this could happen and, and to plan against it. And there's an interesting um, aspect of this going into the licensing or the experimental permit that the FAA um, Issued so in, in, 20, in 2012, they issued an experimental permit to scale to begin flight tests, which happened started in 2013, and scaled analysis of pilot error and and software error was insufficient to meet the standard, but they approved it anyway. They said, well, it doesn't meet exactly the standard, but it's it's sufficient. Now, in the year that followed, by, by the time of renewal, I think this was in May of 2013, they had brought in a bunch of experts from um, the, the recently closed down shuttle program. And these guys looked at this and said, well, this doesn't meet the requirement. They should really stop the program and fix it, you know, do a, do a proper analysis of these areas. So that they don't end up in trouble. But um, George Neal, who was head of the FAA and the other managers, rejected it. They issued a waiver in 2013, July 2013, saying, well, they're taking these other steps, so it's okay. So that's July 2013. And then 18 months later, the, the things brought down by pilot error. Um, so the, the final report criticized the FAA for the waiver. And it's a overall oversight of the uh, program. Uh, there were uh, safety experts who complained about political influence. Nobody identified who or you know who exactly was involved, but they complained about political pressure to keep this program on schedule and to keep other programs on schedule. And that goes back to kind of a dual mandate that the FAA has to both oversee safety and we're talking primarily safety of people on the ground not involved in the flight and and also to promote the industry so it's got a dual mandate and that hasn't always worked out well in the past um it's it's caused problems um in the past where uh, safety was lax uh, in aviation so Virgin Galactic, um, one of the safety experts said above 50,000 feet, the game changes. And the impression I got was that, that scale had analyzed safety in the way it might have done for an airplane and not a rocket plane going Mach 3 that would go Mach 3. Now, um, Virgin Galactic had planned uh, several more flights after um, the October 31st flight. Um, to, to get this thing up to maximum altitude. And they had been planning to fly Richard Branson and his son, Sam, on the first commercial flight in the first quarter of 2015. Um, so the, the Spaceship 2 program was set back about six years in terms of commercial flights. Um, that may have been a very good thing because I think there were a lot of um, 
things they had to go and reevaluate um, and, and do more flight testing to, to kind of um, make this thing safer. Um, I'm still not convinced it's particularly safe, um, but um, you're gonna try to fly um, the first commercial flight with 11 powered flights and five flights into space, which would be a lot more than what they were planning in 2014. So it's possible that uh, some lives are saved by this accident, as, as terrible as that is to say. Um, so just to wrap up here, um, isolation has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, certainly, Mojave is an example of that. Um, having a good echo system is very important around you uh, if you're developing something like this. Um, it may take a number of um, years to kind of build that up. Uh, it's very important to allow people to take risks and to fail. Uh, you learn a lot from your failures. Glenn Shotwell has said that they've, they've learned a lot at SpaceX from, from things that, they, that didn't work. At the same time, safety can't and must be paramount. And it, it's not enough to just say, hey, you know, you're free to, to go do these things. Um, sometimes adult supervision is very needed. Um, space just isn't just hard, it's, it's deadly. And I, I've seen that example out here. And there are definite limits to prizes and, and to hubris. And um, I think I'm just going to end it there. I hope that was interesting. Hi, Doug. That was fantastic. And I think I can speak for everyone. Uh, you wouldn't have seen our chat, our Zoom group chat, but we were, uh, we were pretty active throughout the entire conversation. And if I could sum it all up, I might go with, wow, that's so cool, which was said in about 20 different ways. Oh, uh, everyone, <laughs> I'm, only seeing, like, I'm only seeing like three of you. How many people are out there? Oh, uh, there's a dozen of us. Okay, good. That's a good number. So, questions? Uh, everyone, if you could, uh, well, either type in your questions or alternatively uh, speak up. Um, over to you guys. While people are typing, um, I have a very dull question. Uh, oh. so, so there's typically a balance, um, I guess, within the uh, startup community. And like you said, there's a trade-off between starting, starting up with new technology and safety. Uh, sounds like after the first catastrophe you mentioned, uh, 07, I think it was, there wasn't really any increases in uh, regulatory oversight. Has there been now? It sounds like um, maybe. Yeah, um, presentation might have been a little um, misleading, I think, because I, I put the two kind of nitrous oxide disasters or near disaster second one um, together. Um, definitely they reviewed the rules for, for safety. There haven't been any other incidents of um, people you know, dying and or getting injured um, by being too close to a, a rocket engine test. They've done a lot of tests. And um, I did go out um, when x -Corp was here, went out to the bunker. They had an old, um, they had a test stand and then they had um, old munitions bunkers that they operated out of. It used to hold munitions when, when this was like a Marine Corps base. And they were very careful about, you know, safety and they had procedures in place. So I, I think that was definitely cleared up a lot. But um, why you'd store a rocket fuel next to a nitrous oxide tank is just beyond me. And I think the thinking on that was just that, you know, it's hard to ignite and it is, but, but somehow it did and then you know, you had firefighters who, who didn't understand what they were doing. So I, I think there, there wasn't, I think the airport during that period didn't have like a safety director experience in these things who's constantly asking, what if, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, and I saw 
I, I think the, the problem with the, the scale flight was, was uh, similar. People weren't asking, what if? What if this happens early? What if it, you know, and, and thinking through all those um, eventualities. Does that answer the question at all? Absolutely. Uh, I, I uh, think um, uh, Stu Witt um, left about five years ago, and the successor, Karina Dries, was, I think, a bit more uh, focused on safety issues. Um, and, and she had an experienced um, airport manager she brought in to kind of oversee things. So I, I think it's, it's gotten a lot better. It just, um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't think that you don't know it, you can end up uh, in trouble. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, and well, I think maybe explain it to me one day. <laughs> I think Emmeline had a question. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's see. Because we're in New Zealand, so I, I am going to ask this question. And it's slightly a little controversial, I, uh, I guess. And I know that you talked more about Virgin Galactic as opposed to Virgin Orbit. But um, so the difference between the two, for, the, for those who, who, who don't, one is um, really for, for human, uh, you know, suborbital flight, which is Virgin Galactic. The other one is more as a, as a transport for, for commercial uh, um, nanosatellites. And um, my question is that uh, today, of course, Rocket Lab um, is the first one uh, that's sort of like really pioneered the this subcategory of small launchers, and right. with, with the new uh, um, Virgin Orbit now you know coming on board and uh, and a successful kind of uh, uh, launch for launching satellites, uh, I kind of like uh, think that now there is now a, a real competitor to to uh, to, uh, to Rocket Lab, um, but there's also uh, comparisons where you know people talking about that that he uh, that Virgin has spent one billion as opposed to like Rocket Lab having spent only a <laughs> hundred million plus kind of like it's a big difference between the two. Um, uh, I wanted to get your your opinion <laughs> on uh, uh, basically this two you know this two com this two um, rocket companies. Uh, uh, so yeah. Just, uh, just wanted to get your thoughts. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've been talking to a friend of mine who's um, involved in the business side of, of, of launching and, and things like that, and he's had some interesting uh, observations. Um, he thinks that the Rocket Lab Electron is is too is size too small in terms of its payload. And that it was aimed for the, the smaller kind of CubeSat market. And this may be an issue with Virgin Galactic as well. And, and there's not, there's money there and there's certainly payloads there, but um, he thinks that um, uh, boosters with uh, capable of, um, you know, maybe putting a ton into low order, you know, metric ton. Um, and I think that's Firefly Aerospace, which they're, they're going to be launching, I think, last I saw the estimate was mid-March out of Vandenberg, which is due west of here. Mm -hmm. And if you remind me later, I'll tell you stories about that. Um, but, um, and also the, the other one that I saw today was this ABLE, um, ABL space, um, which Lockheed Martin is invested in. And they're capable of launching um, 1,350 or 1,380 kilograms into lower orbit. Um, so there might be there might be a market a, a bigger market there. The other thing is that uh, SpaceX being competitive as it is 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 kind of sopping up a lot of uh, capacity. They just launched uh, how many satellites was that? Like 148. Yeah, it's now the yeah. record at the moment. But, but yeah. again, there's a difference between uh, launching like a bus and launching like an Uber, which is, I think, the, the main thing here. At yeah, the, yeah. Kind of like the frequency of launch. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated area. And I need to really, um, what I need to do is sit down and, and kind of map out um, payload capacity and cost and, and maybe do that in a spreadsheet and try to figure out, you know, yeah. uh, 
who's, who's likely to succeed here. But um, at some point, do you remember Carl, Carl, Carlos Niederstrasser? Yeah. Yeah. Nice you guy. Yeah. So he worked at, uh, he's still working at, in, in a long time career. At, um, he's still there at uh, Orbital, Orbital Science. And it became uh, Orbital ATK. And then it became uh, Northrop Grumman. And that L1011 went through a couple of paint jobs within about three or four years. They changed the, the corporate colors on it. Um, went from red to kind of gray to, I'm not sure what it is now, uh, whatever North or kind of a blue. Um, so anyway, he was, um, he would he would go to Small Sat, which is in Logan, Utah. And I recommend that. That's the best conference I've ever been to. Best parties at night, you know, and, and a lot of good material during the day. Um, great material during the day. Um, so he, he would come every year and give an estimate of how many launch companies were out there trying to go for the, the small sat launchers. And I, I remember the, the one year it was like, I saw him at like three o'clock, you know, gave a presentation, it was like 107 different projects. And I saw him at a reception about three hours later, it become like 110. Because somebody had told him about three more. So yeah, there's, there's a big, about 50 plus now. I big think bubble um, in the small sat area. And it, it's gonna be interesting to see what um, what comes out. But I, yeah, I think uh, Virgin Orbit's probably a good competitor for Rocket Lab. And, and we'll see how well these other larger um, companies do and, and have bigger payload. Um, one of the, the big business is um, two side businesses that have, have come up is um, kind of packaging the small sats. So you have a company called Space Flight um, out of uh, Washington State. Uh, you get some uh, companies in Europe, uh, Exo Launch, and they'll put your satellites together and, and they have deployers and things like that. There's also a, a market for taking satellites from where they're left off to where they need to go. So there's um, there's like little space tugs that'll do that. Uh, so and then um, Rocket Labs been pretty creative about using their upper stage. They want to uh, do their upper stage and send a small uh, spacecraft to Venus to explore Venus, and that that can open up a lot of um, a lot of opportunities, you know, they could send that to the moon or maybe Mars. And they, they, there have been CubeSats at the moon and Mars and this whole small satellite industry is just, it's a bad word, but exploding. Um, so there, there's a lot of stuff going on and I, I hope that answered your question maybe. Yeah, no, maybe. Yeah, no worries. I think there's <laughs> another person who, uh, yeah. who raised their hand. Okay. I've got uh, another question, particularly uh, lots of interest in hearing how the space industry is shaping up, um, particularly when it comes to any thoughts on SpaceX's Starship uh, prototypes, uh, SN8 and S SN9, probably yeah. got a few. Um, yeah, um, we'll see how well that goes. I think it's still very experimental at this point and I think if it if it succeeds, if you can get that to succeed, um, that changes the whole game. You know, if you can get a, a reusable uh, system that can go into orbit, and they're, they're also the the other accompanied by a super heavy booster with, you know, I think twenty four uh, uh, Raptor engines uh, would be the first stage. So. If they can do, um, if it works, wow, everything becomes kind of obsolete. Um, I think it's very much on the edge. And it's, it's been entertaining to see um, see the flights go, you know, they, the last two have crashed. And it, it's amazing. Um, they had, a, I, I guess, a delay. Uh, they were supposed to fly on a, on a Thursday or SpaceX wanted to fly on a Thursday, but they didn't have a launch license. Um, so it got delayed to Monday and the internet just exploded. You know, the Twitter exploded and it's like, well, oh, what's the FAA doing? And now oh, they're being persecuted. And, you know, Musk um, said, we'll never get to Mars with FAA. And 
you know, all these regulations. And it, it turns out that um, from the FAA's perspective, they had done the SN8 launch. They'd asked for a waiver from, from a requirement for the SN8 launch. They didn't get it. And then they went ahead with a launch, um, which is like the FAA does not like that. They do not like that. They, you, you. And, and it, you know, it kind of fits must personality when they closed down uh, the California, uh, uh, the county, Alameda County, uh, closed down businesses uh, last year for the, for the COVID. Musk refused to shut down. He stayed open for another week at Tesla. Um, there are reports that uh, they didn't have proper um, uh, breathing and masks. Um, when the state decided to reopen, he, did, he didn't wait for approval from the county. He reopened and he said, oh, come down and arrest me if you want. And just, you know, he doesn't, it, it's a disturbing part is he just like, yeah, rules, regulations, laws. And, and you saw that also with the, um, the SEC and he, he tweeted out that he was going to take Tesla private and he had the money uh, lined up to do it. And that was false and got fined for it. And so that's, um, anyway, that's, that's, um, I've gone off on a tangent, but uh, if- Billionaires, if, uh, billionaires, they just don't operate in the same universe we do. No, I, th I think we have- Bezos either. I think we have one last question. Uh, Ian, would you be comfortable asking your question? Uh, actually, uh, I was trying to wait to the end just to say hello. Uh, I'm a friend of Doug's from California, but I have also <laughs> yeah. uh, talked with Doug since the uh, pandemic began. Uh, yeah. But uh, I have also been, you, you can see in the, the background that I put up here is a picture I took when I was in Wellington in 2007. And I'm sure all of you know where that is. Um, and uh, I, I had a great time visiting at the Carter Observatory there and uh, I got a uh, they, they gave me a special presentation about the southern sky, and then uh, we made an arrangement that the next night I brought up some slides from a presentation I had given at the Space uh, Access Conference in Phoenix, uh, because, uh, you know, with, we didn't know about export rules on anything that hadn't already been made public, so I just took a presentation that was already in public and uh, gave the same thing there. If there's any chance that somebody was at that presentation, I'd love to hear uh, if we if we already met. <laughs> but in any case, I was here to show some support for Doug, and I did uh, post a few things in the chat during it, like when someone asked about the size of the satellites that are launched by uh, the, um, the the uh, the the rockets that drop um, th that are dropped from the planes. I, I mentioned those are small satellites. Uh, some things. Yeah. Like, I'm, so I'm the one who did that. Yeah. So kind of trying to help out a little bit when I knew the answer. I did briefly uh, live in Mojave and worked at XCOR while I was there, but uh, uh, Doug is definitely correct in saying that the company was falling apart. And when I saw what was going on, I decided not to sell my house in San Jose and I moved back to it. So that's where I am right now. Okay. Was there a question or? No, I, I just, uh, some of it was uh, just uh, show support for you and, and also wanted to find out if anybody uh, f had, uh, had been at my presentation there in Wellington in 2007. Okay, well, that's the easiest question I've had today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm sure. Yeah, I, you know, obviously I've followed a lot of your stuff and so I wanted to watch your presentation too, but uh, definitely had to get in a hello at the end here uh, because uh, I loved the visit to Wellington and I'd love to go back. Okay, me too. I've never been there, so invite me down. <laughs> There's the There's same latitude north as, as we are no? south, so you'll like it. I, I just saw a silence. The, uh, chat. Uh, we've got one quick last question. <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure it's going to be an easy <laughs> yeah, one, though. I know. Oh, no. um, considering your expertise in, uh, uh, in the Star Trek uh, universe, um, when do you think we'll have warp capability? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I just claimed by some scientists that uh, aliens have visited Earth and there's this secret base on Mars. So um, we might have it next week. You know, the, Mar the aliens come out and say, hey, you know, hey, Earthlings. 
come hang out with us and we'll give you a warp drive. Um, so don't spread um, conspiracy theories. So, what's that? Don't spread conspiracy theories. <laughs> oh no, I would never do that. Um, Oh, um, also, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know if this connects to the actual talk, but uh, last week I wrote a story about how Virgin Galactic almost lost the ship and crew on their second space flight. So that's up on the site, and I'm probably going to do a follow up. Um, it was interesting. I I'd known about it for a while. I asked. I sent an email to Virgin Galactic on Wednesday. I got it back on. Uh, answered back Friday after the markets had closed. So I'm working on this thing on Monday and suddenly I look on Twitter and suddenly the Washington Post is writing about the same thing. And they somehow had gotten an advanced copy of a book uh, by a journalist who had been embedded with them and didn't come out till May, but uh, apparently they got this book and he knew exactly where to look to to, do, to write that story, so he beat me to the punch. So I, I think it might have been Virgin trying to get on top of the story. I don't know, but um, if if you're uh, look for a, a follow up uh, story, probably for me this week. Um, if you're interested in, in Virgin and how things are going, and they haven't uh, their last powered flight, their last space flight was two years ago. Uh, coming up on the 22nd and part of it's COVID and part of it was um, having to, they lost the, the horizontal stabilizer blew out on one of the wings. So they're very lucky to get the ship and the crew back. And um, they had to do a lot of redesigning and, and they had to fix the, uh, uh, replace the elevons. Uh, so it's pretty complicated and um, so they had a successful first flight in December 2018, then February uh, 2019, had the second one that nearly crashed. They, they tried another one in December and the engine cut off after the computer lost contact with it. So when I say that this stuff is risky, it is risky and there's, there's a lot of unknowns. So I hope I didn't go over too much. Was that okay? I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you so very much. This was incredibly enjoyable. Uh, Doug, that was a great speech. It was super interesting. I don't know that we've ever had such a dynamic uh, group chat uh, that was going on while you were speaking, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as you about what you were speaking on. Uh, it was fantastic. Ian, th many thanks for your clarifications. And uh, we'll be posting this, a link to this online, probably within 24 hours. And uh, many thanks to everyone who, in fact, Doug, thank you. It's going to be almost midnight for you at this point. <laughs> I have no idea. What, what I'm, I don't have a clock. Yeah, let me check. Hold on. It's going to be like 11.30. 11 yeah, it's almost 11.30. Mm. Yeah, I'm in the same time zone. <laughs> I have a, I, I did another talk, which I've given at, at Space Access, and I think Ian was there for that, um, that delves into the, the flight and the, uh, the the crash and the NTSB report in a lot of depth. If you're interested in that, I can do it at another time. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. We, we won't keep you up now, but uh, I'd love to be able to put some more information out and get some interested parties. That sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah, let me know. Um, you know, or whenever that fits in your schedule, I can do it. I've, I've, you know, it's all ready to go. So, Nito. All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate uh, seeing Emmeline again. Um, hey, how's it going? Say hello to Eric for me. Um, yeah. Thanks for the. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Sure. Many um, thanks. Fascinating. I, you can sign off now. Cool. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.